Today's tutorial is about enhancing an old cordless screwdriver to make it ready for IoT, Internet of Things applications. The idea is to apply a so-called IoT retrofit. In particular, we want to be able to monitor the screwdriver's current state, for example whether it is running or not. For the monitoring, we want to have a web-based user interface. Just to lower the expectations, this tutorial gives only a deep dive into the general approach of retrofitting a device. Topics that are covered are what is IoT, what is an IoT retrofit, and what are possible approaches to retrofit this particular cordless screwdriver. So this tutorial does not cover to make a fully working IoT screwdriver. For example, the final housing will be missing, the wiring will be done by simple jumper wire hooks, and so on and so on. But still, I hope this tutorial will be of some value to you. By the way, this tutorial is based on my written article where you find some additional information. Okay, so before we start with the actual retrofit, we have to establish a common understanding for IoT and for the tutorial's IoT application. So first of all, what is IoT? It's an abbreviation for Internet of Things. If you dig deeper into the topic of IoT, you find a lot of different definitions, but the common ground is basically always that IoT addresses networks for things. So what are things? Typically they are physical objects like cars, washing machines, surveillance cameras, assembly lines, or like today, screwdrivers. In IoT, things are communicating and exchange data over a network, and the network does not need to be the internet. It can be also some sort of private network. Uh, humans are also included in IoT. Humans can access an IoT network by a human-to-machine interface, yeah, like a graphical user interface, in order to enter some data, and then the data is delivered to the device to configure it, to control it, whatever. And with a human-machine interface, you are also able to monitor some data that is coming from a device. So in order to take part in IoT applications, things must fulfill some requirements. So first of all, they need some sort of connectivity function to be able to join a network and then to exchange some data with other things. And the second requirement, which is also very important, is that things must support a specific communication protocol that is understand in the network. And sometimes it can be communication protocol A, sometimes it can be communication protocol B. So this can be totally different. Very often you have a situation like this. You have a device which speaks, for example, HTTP REST. Then you have another device that speaks MQTT. And then there's maybe one more device which speaks AMQP. In such situations, you can use middleware or gateway software that is used to translate from communication protocol to another communication protocol. So in the end, all the different protocols are translated to a single protocol and uh, things are able to communicate inside the network. But now the majority of old devices does not fulfill these requirements at all. So very often they do not feature any connectivity function at all. So for example, my old screwdriver, it has a button and it has a switch so that I am as a human are able to control it. Yeah, but the screwdriver does not have any connectivity function to join a Wi-Fi network. Yeah, that's simply not possible. For such situations, what you can do is an IoT retrofit. So IoT retrofitting means to upgrade or enhance old devices so that they fulfill requirements for IoT applications. There are different approaches. For example, if you have a device that has a very good microcontroller integrated, you can use this microcontroller. So sometimes all you have to do is to perform a firmware update. And with the firmware update comes a new communication protocol that is then spoken by the device. If you can do something like this, you can call it software-based IoT retrofit. But also sometimes you don't have a hardware inside the device. You don't have a microcontroller that you can use. So in these scenarios, you have to integrate a new hardware into the device somehow. And this is called then hardware-based IoT retrofit. What needs to be done totally depends on the specific use case. 
there is no official standard that describes the requirements for IoT devices. So instead, there are many, many different IoT applications with many, many different requirements. So you have to figure out for yourself what is needed, what is the network infra infrastructure, what IoT protocol is needed, do I need Wi-Fi, do I need Bluetooth, do I need, I don't know, a cable. So uh, this totally depends on the specific application. And today, in this tutorial, we have a screwdriver, we have a private Wi-Fi network, and then there's me yeah, who is accessing um, a browser or a website through the browser. And the idea is that the user is able to monitor the screwdriver states, for example, whether the screwdriver is running and in which direction is it running, forward or backward then it should be possible to see the states um, through a website and the website should be served by the screwdriver itself and the website should be accessible in a private Wi-Fi network so the human and the screwdriver are basically in the same network. And that's it, that's the agenda for today. Let's go on with the actual retrofit and check our requirements. We must be able to detect the screwdriver state, in particular whether it is running and whether it is driving clock or anti-clockwise, or in other words, forward or reverse state. Next, we must integrate a network interface that can be accessed via a normal web browser to monitor the state values. And of course, we need some computation logic to process the state data and to serve a website where the state data can be monitored. In addition, we must somehow power the computation unit. Luckily, the screwdriver has a 3.6 volt rechargeable battery inside. A device that helps us to fulfill our requirements is for example an ESP32 microcontroller. The inputs allow us to sense the state values. We can run a web server on the microcontroller to serve a website to the user. And moreover, it requires 3.3 volt, which fits to the 3.6 volt rechargeable battery. Okay, let's start. The first step is to open it up. We can simply open it by unscrewing four screws, which allows us to remove the upper housing part. What you see now are the inner parts, the C motor, rechargeable battery and some PCBs. The rechargeable battery shall be used as power source for our ESP32. This is quite simple. Just wire the cell's cathode, the blue wire, to the microcontroller's ground pin. And the anode, the red wire, to the microcontroller's 3.3 volt pin. I will wire the ESP's 3.3 volt pin later, because if I did it now, the ESP32 would start to boot up and I don't have a program deployed yet. The PCB on the top has some LEDs that indicate whether the screwdriver is running as well as the direction. The LEDs are controlled by these pins. To find out the screwdriver state, we need to grab the status of the upper and lower LED. I guess you can figure out how it works with some thought. If there's a low signal on the middle and right pin, the upper and lower LEDs are switched off, so the screwdriver is not running. If the right pin goes high, the upper LED is switched on. This means the screwdriver is running and in forward state. If the middle pin goes high instead, the lower LED is switched on. This means the screwdriver is running and in reverse state. What's left to do is to wire the middle and right pin to our ESP32. I wired the right pin to the GPU pin 2 and the middle pin to GPU pin 4. And that's all we have to do for the wiring. Next comes the programming. Let's put the web server aside for a moment and focus on the core logic. We have two pins, GPIO2 represents the forward state and GPIO4 represents the reverse state. The screwdriver is running if one of the two pins is high. We can use the exclusive OR operator for this. Here you find an IF condition that becomes true 
if both pins are high. This is a normally unreachable special case and means that a screwdriver is actually not running so that forward and reverse state are false. The remaining part of the program is to print out the state variables. So let's try out the program. And you can see if I start the screwdriver, the serial monitor shows the information including the forward and reverse state. So what's left is the web server that can be accessed by a browser to monitor the screwdriver state. Luckily the ESP32 ecosystem provides a lot of functionality to create a web server. We need a Wi-Fi and web server libraries. What changed to the previous program is that there is a web server listening on port 80. Moreover, the microcontroller connects to a Wi-Fi with an SSID and password. If you want to use the code on your personal Wi-Fi, you have of course to change these values. When connected, the microcontroller prints out its IP. The web server is programmed to have five URLs, the root URL for serving the web page and three additional URLs that return the running, forward and reverse state. And then there is one URL that returns all three states together. Maybe you have noticed it already, the states are returned in the JSON data format. The loop function is very similar to the previous program. There's an additional call for the web server and the current IP address is printed out. For serving the web page, I put all the code in a single function called handle root. What you see here is some HTML and JavaScript code that is delivered to the user's browser. The HTML code describes a very basic web page to show the three different state variables. And the JavaScript code calls each 500 milliseconds the state's URL to receive all three state variables. Okay, so let's try out the web server example. So here we have the IP address of the microcontroller. Let's call it with a browser. And you see here the website. And the state variables are updated. We could also use the other URLs to get a current value of a specific state, or instead of monitoring the states ourselves, we could configure some other IoT devices to monitor the values and do something with the data. But that's maybe something for another tutorial. So let's summarize. We used an old screwdriver to perform an IoT retrofit. We integrated an ESP32 microcontroller to the screwdriver. And as a result, we are able to monitor the screwdriver state with a web page that is served by the microcontroller. Of course, if we wanted to really use the screwdriver now, there's much more to do, like 3D printing and new housing plus many more things. But as I said in the beginning, the idea of this tutorial was only to introduce you a bit into the topic of IoT retrofitting. I hope you enjoyed the video. That's it. Goodbye.